This is Jeff Deist, and you're listening to the Human Action Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again. It's the Human Action Podcast, and if you've been following along, you know that we are making our way through Man, Economy, and State, Murray Rothbard's uh, probably most famous work, really his treatise on economics. Uh, We're using the second edition, which is available from the Mises Institute. So if you're reading along in terms of page numbers and all that good stuff, uh, that's the edition you want. It's available for free at Mises.org as an HTML uh, searchable, broken up by chapter. So it's really a great resource for you. But you can also buy the book via our website if you choose to do so. And we've already worked our way through the opening chapter on sort of human action and then the subsequent couple of chapters on uh, price and exchange where Rothbard's really laying out uh, some of the basic concepts of the book, really being precise with his definitions and uh, really giving us a mini course of sorts in those early chapters on money going through Menger and the origins, going through Mises, going through the concept of the regression theorem, going through concepts of commodity. So uh, we have finished that and moving on to the next section of the book, which is all about production, the structure. This consists of about five chapters. It's a huge chunk of the book, several hundred pages. And so for today's purposes, we're just going to go through that introductory chapter, chapter five called production, the structure. And I'm very pleased to have with me in studio our great friend, Dr. Sean Rittenauer, a personal friend of mine, someone I've gotten to know over the last couple of years, uh, visited him at Grove City College in Pennsylvania, uh, also a thoroughgoing Rothbardian, and just so happens to be in Auburn this week for our great Mrs. U seminar, which has been a lot of fun to be, you know, have some live people in a live event. And one of the lectures he gives at Mrs. U is called Austrian Capital Theory. So that relates very closely to what we're talking about. And so all that said, Sean, it's so good to have you here this week. Appreciate it. Oh, thank you. It's a delight to be here as always. Well, I want to start with this. Just the fact that there's so many chapters uh, given to this concept of production uh, by Rothbard in his treatise, I think that 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 arrangement of the book almost tells us something in and of itself. Yeah, I think um, it's pretty clear that he thought that that was, uh, say, one area in Austrian economics that needed to be more developed. I think that uh, you know he, uh, it's understood he set out to write uh, *Man, Economy, and State* as sort of uh, an introduction to Mises or a popularization of human action, and then I think he got to the production part of the theory and realized there's a lot in human action that Mises sort of assumes that we know about production and he thought it needed to be fleshed out and the more – and so he goes he goes back to Bambavirk and the more he thinks about it, the more he decides we need to be – he just needs to be more exhaustive and, and, and that's what he was. I mean he, he ended up having an exhaustive treatment of, of production uh, from a – in some sense from a very uh, sort of uh, – what should one say – simple and abstract um, – case and then he he builds and builds and builds to account for the full uh, dynamic uh, you know pr- pr- full production in a dynamic economy so it's a tremendous it's really it is important and it's it's a it's a it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important contribution of the development of Austrian economics well unfortunately it looks like America needs a refresher course <laughs> because we even see economists like Krugman and, and politicians like AOC right now just saying, well, everyone should just be home and government should send them a check. And this is crazy. The government should be taking care of people as though nothing has to be produced. It's, it's insane. I know. It, it's, it's as if, uh, you know, somehow uh, it, it's, in, in a way it's like Rexford Tugwell all over again. We've conquered scarcity. Now it's just a matter of how can we distribute it to people that are in need and uh, it, it it forgets the 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 fact that we can only we only have consumer goods if they are first produced. And so if we if we don't if we don't somehow enable people to be productive, uh, you can live relatively high on the hog through government largesse for a short period of time. Um, I just heard uh, from uh, the James Grant podcast that because of the uh, the unemployment and other government assistance that uh, average disposable income for the American family for the last I don't know few months is has actually gone slightly up just in terms of in dollar terms 
But obviously this can't go on forever because at some point, I mean, the prices can still go up, but you're not going to be able to buy anything because things aren't being produced if everyone's stuck in their home. And, and so it's it's um, <laughs> it's one thing if politicians are saying this, but when other people who are, are supposed to be economists talk this way, it's it's in some ways relatively uh, well, relatively depressing. Well, I think James Grant has identified why things might still seem sort of quasi-normal in your town. Why are police being paid? Why are yards being mowed? Why is there still stuff at the grocery and at CVS? And I think that's it. I think the federal government is is uh, just passing out money. Uh, I want to mention that the great uh, Huerta de Soto, Jesus Huerta de Soto, in his you know huge treatise on banking, he has a couple of graphs and charts in that book, and one of them says that uh, you know capital theory is lacking in other schools. And your lecture this week is called Austrian Capital Theory. So can you help us understand what what does he mean by you know a, a theory of capital is lacking in Keynesian or mainstream economics? Yes, um, when he says that it's lacking, it really means that there's there's e- either there's not much of a capital theory or a theory of how capital goods, the importance of capital goods, or the there's certainly no structure of, of capital structure in uh, modern mainstream macro. Um, and if there is, it's not done very well. So there is, there is sort of a school of thought that says, well, yes, of course, capital goods are important for production, but we're going to uh, model uh, capital, one, as if Capital is just a, a, a sort of a blob of homogeneous units. So every unit of a capital good is exactly like every other unit. In which case, I mean, if that was the case, then yes, we don't have to we don't have to talk much about capital theory because it's real simple. You just insert a, 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 a take a unit from one place and put it someplace else, just like a like a like a Lego block or something, and everything is it's it's a simple it's simple. But of course. Capital goods are very uh, heterogeneous, right? Um, a, a hammer is very unlike a, a personal computer, and so it, it requires entrepreneurs to allocate capital goods effectively. But beyond that, those that say, "Well, okay, maybe yes, capital goods are are heterogeneous, but capital itself, what we call capital, is a perpetually reproducing fund, right? So we don't have to actually think about." Well, well. Uh, once we have capital and, and and we use it, we don't have to think about well, what does it take to maintain uh, our availability of capital goods or the, uh, maintain a, a company's capital, the, the 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 value of those capital goods. If it's if it's perpetual, then you know if it's always going to be there, we don't have to, to to worry about it. We don't even have to consider it, so we don't have to develop a theory or analyze it in any way. And what Austrian economics uh, brings to the table, if you will, is this understanding that uh, the means uh, that people use to achieve ends are means that are chosen by people based on their subjective preferences. And specific means are chosen to uh, achieve specific ends. And for producers, that means when you know there, there's always a, a number of alternatives of ways you can try to arrange production to produce a particular uh, thing. If, if you want to produce a shirt, you can you know you have different uh, types of fabric to choose from. You have different types of colors of fabric to choose from. You'd have different um, you know styles of shirts that you can choose from, all requiring slightly different if, if I'm if uh, different things. If I want to make a t-shirt, I don't need to have plastic buttons, but if I want to make a dress shirt, I need buttons. Um, things like that. There's all those different types of capital goods that go into the production of a particular product. And um, Austrians understand this. And then what they also understand is that all production takes time. Uh, that's one thing that's emphasized by Rothbard that, and, and Huerta de Soto and all Austrians. All production takes time, which means when people engage in production, they have to make investments first in obtaining factors of production, land, labor, capital goods, produce the product that then they hope to sell at some point in time in the future. Right? And so – uh, if you're going to make a T-shirt, you need to have the fabric. But then, well, where does the fabric come from? To have the fabric, you of course have to have, say, the the, the if it's natural, you have to have the raw cotton that can be spun into, uh, uh, you know, fibers that can then be weaved or woven into 
uh, uh, fabric that then can be cut uh, and and then sewn together to make the shirt. That is a that is a multi stage, time uh, intensive uh, process, and the Austrians understand that. And, um, it, and and because they understand that, they know that the whole capital structure for you, the whole production structure has to fit together in a way. In, in, in other words, for the shirt to take to, to, to come together, it's not enough for, say, the fabric to be made sometime, somewhere. The fabric has to be made at the right time, available in the right place. And so there's an awful lot of coordination that, 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 that needs to take place for just a T-shirt to be made. And the same thing holds true for all other uh, for other other types of capital or consumer goods. And so, uh, you know, it, it, given 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 that complexity and 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 the the what should the the decentraliz the, the decentralization of production in a market division of labor that we enjoy in a market economy because it it, it allows us to be way more productive and more prosperous than we would be otherwise. To enjoy that again, it requires a lot of economic decisions made by a lot of different entrepreneurs and and if if uh, entrepreneurs at different times are led astray it can cause you know bottlenecks and it can cause uh, markets to get snarled and um, if if it happens on a large enough scale uh, we could have you know recession and depression so and, and that's all that's 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 all hard to see when you have this lack of capital theory well, so uh, if we think about the structure of production as having multiple vertical stages, think of it sort of like a ladder. Yeah. You mentioned a shirt. And by the way, buttons should be made of mother and pearl, not plastic. We're not savages here at the Mises Institute. That's an aside. But think of it as a ladder. And, and let's say there's a, let's say, you know, right now, one of the hottest uh, lower order goods or retail good is a Ford F-150, which they're selling a ton of with the aforementioned uh, stimulus and Fed funding yeah. money. Um, so between that Ford F-150 that the consumer wants and purchases and way, way up at the top of that ladder would be, I guess, the public shareholders of Ford. There's an awful lot of stages in between suppliers, parts, the dealership, all kinds of things. And and so one thing Rothbard does in this chapter is to to First of all, I'll give you an easier construct is to say, well, let's assume that that whole ladder is owned by one owner. Yeah. And of course, that's not, you know, later on in the chapter, he says, well, OK, here's how we look at it if we have amalgamated owners. Uh, so, so just talk a little bit more about the ladder. Yeah. So the ladder is simply is, is uh, what, what he calls he calls the structure production. It's the it's the uh, shall we say the the inter the intertemporal connection between uh, the different stages of producer goods that ultimately culminate in, in, in the production of consumer good. Uh, he, this, really, it's, it's um, uh, Carl Menger who uh, really uh, sort, of, um, sort of contributes this idea of the relationship between the consumer good and then what he calls the goods of the higher order or the factors of production it takes to produce the consumer good. And so every – the production of every consumer good is uh, supported by this – several stages high uh, structure where production has to take place first at the higher stages, right? If we're going to make a, 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 a pickup, uh, iron ore has to be mined first, and then that iron ore has to be uh, processed into steel of, of, of a certain type, and then the steel has to be cut in a certain way and then shaped and then formed and then and then you know in, into a chassis or into the um into the the you know the, the outer frame and then of course along with that there has to be the rest of you know the rest of the stuff that goes into making uh, the vehicle and that all has to be brought to bear right but but you you don't start you don't first make the the, the F150 and then get the uh, parts it takes to make it, right? All of those things have to be made first. And so if you look at the, at, at the production process, if you will, you look at that uh, – I, I liken the production structure sort of to the family tree of a consumer good. You can sort of trace it back to its genealogy and you realize that production uh, effort – uh, begins at the highest stages and moves down the structure of production. So it, we have to start with the iron ore, and then we get to the steel, and then we get to the frame, and then we get to the finished product. Um, we we can't we don't start with the finished product and then somehow get the iron ore that goes into it. And so that's very important because what that tells us 
is that and and um, this is one of the great you know uh, applications of um, Rothbard here uh, is that uh, to uh, you know to 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 to, to uh, benefit from prosperity to 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 uh, work towards economic progress or to grow the economy. If you want to use a sort of a faulty uh, metaphor, um, it's not. We're not going to achieve that by stimulating consumption. Right? If we just want to, like you say, we just want to you know we want to spend more money buying F one fifties. Well, that's great. We can do that until we run out of F one fifties. But if we if if that's all we do and we don't. If there has been no investment in mining, in uh, refining, in uh, you know uh, mixing steel with other things, uh, we're not going to have any more F-150s once we run out. And so we cannot sustainably uh, you know maintain uh, an, uh, an economic order or expand the economic order and expand prosperity by trying to stimulate consumption. It has to happen through saving and investment. People have to be willing to put off present consumption. You know, say in the short term, uh, reduce their consumption of shirts and uh, pickup trucks and what have you, and save their resources that makes those so those resources are available to invest in iron ore mining and steel manufacturing, so that they will be available for more consumer goods in the future. And uh, so that's one that's that's one important uh, implication, if you will, of this structure of production, the sort of family tree of the consumer good. Now, there's an interesting treatment in Chapter Five by Rothbard of cost. Yes, and this is something where uh, uh, Professor Parabyland at uh, Oklahoma State does a great job of slicing and dicing people on Twitter with this one. Uh, but cost, you know, how much something costs to produce in in dollar terms which we need to calculate, um, you know, this, it really sounds like a kissing cousin of the labor theory of value. And we, we, we keep having people talk about cost even today. And so Rothbard has this great uh, quote at page 342 where he says, cost has no influence on the price of the product. Uh, and he goes on to quote uh, Thurlby as saying, cost is ephemeral. So help us understand why we still have to disabuse people of the, this idea that cost determines price. Yeah, I think uh, he helpfully uh, fingers, in some sense, Alfred Marshall uh, drawing upon uh, the classical economics, which uh, the classical econ- – and, and fr- when he says classical, he really means in, in this context British classical economics, British classical tradition, which um, uh, Marshall thought he was updating. And uh, so Marshall had this idea that – well, yes, if we look at if we look well okay, sure, if we look at the demand side of things, yes, I, I guess you know the, the prices that consumers are willing to pay for a product is determined by their subjective values. Fine. their margin chili. That's great. But but uh, the producers, the sellers, right? They're obviously not going to want to sell any product and 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 not make a profit or at least not they don't they want to at least break even. And so the price that they're going to charge is going to be – has to be at least equal to the cost of uh, – the cost of production. And, and, and in equilibrium, the, the prices will be driven to cost of production. Ergo, cost of production determines what the price is going to be. Um, and and, and uh, yeah, Rothbard mentions uh, Marshall's uh, scissors uh, analogy that – is like supply and demand are two blades of the scissors, and both of them cut together. So yes, margin utility matters a little bit, and, but cost of production matters too. And in fact, in the long run, in terms of long run costs, it's cost of production that are dominant. Right? And what Rothbard points out in this chapter is that first of all, costs, you know, uh, what you want to call it, ultimate economic cost is first of all subjective. It, it's the, the cost of something is what we give up to do something. Right? So if I if if I you know, you know need to buy a shirt, and in buying the shirt I cannot uh, I, I can't uh, I have to do without say um, a basketball, then the cost of the shirt is really the foregone satisfaction I would have from the basketball, and and that's subjective, right? Um, and uh, so if we understand that that is the nature of cost, right? Once the good is produced, 
once the good is produced, the costs are sunk. Right? The costs are sunk. And so uh, the decision to, you know, the decision of what price I'm willing to accept for the product is determined by the preferences of the seller. Again, we're back to subjective preferences. And so what Rothbard does an excellent job of showing that, no, it's not, there's, in no case do objective costs of production determine the price of the good, right? Now, what he does say is that, okay, the costs of production, the, 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 the monetary expenses that um, it takes to obtain the factors used to produce a product, that is going to uh, determine or help determine uh, how many units you can produce. Right? And so you know, the, the amount of money you invest in production and the prices of the factors, the costs of the fact, those that will determine, help determine the quantity of the goods produced. Right? But once the goods are produced, those costs are, uh, they, they don't determine uh, the selling price that the, that the seller is willing to accept. I think that's what Thrillby means when it then it's ephemeral, right? Uh, the costs, the costs, the costs, um, the cost of production are there, but they don't determine the price of the product. What determines the price of the product is the subjective preference of the seller and the subjective preference of the buyer at at that time. And 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 we and in some sense we know we know this is the case, right? I mean, if if w what happens when um, when uh, you know a, 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 a retailer brings some products to the market and they have the price on the on the the, the offer price that they have on the uh, on on the price tag and people uh, people aren't buying. Right? What, what do they do? Do they just sit and let them sit and say, "Well, this is the cost of production and this is what the price is, and I'm not going to lower it because I heard in my micro class from Alfred Marshall that the price is determined by cost of production." Well, no, they lower the price, right? And so it's it's the it's it's it, you know costs costs have an impact on the quantity of the good that's produced, but once it's produced. It's that, that th those cost considerations fade away. Well, it's interesting. During the aforementioned, again, Dr. Bylan's uh, talk yesterday, he pointed out how sometimes entrepreneurs give us things we didn't know we needed or wanted. And the left thinks that's a bad thing, of yeah. course. Yeah. But, you know, let's take Apple, for example. Let's say they're going to come out with some new shiny gadget. Yeah. And we haven't even thought of beyond right. the, the smartphone or the tablet or whatever it's going to be. And let's say they have really smart internal cost accounting, mm -hmm. and they can sort of figure out all their R&D and labor and parts costs and, and really get down to an accurate number for what this new gadget is going to cost per unit. Mm -hmm. I bet you they go out of their way not to let anybody know what that number is. Oh, and absolutely. I bet you it has very little to do with the psychology of what they sell it for. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. I mean, because if you... <laughs> You don't want you don't want. Um, I mean, they know that they would much prefer if, if the if the if the cost of a, of an item is say two hundred dollars, they would much rather sell it for a thousand, right? They don't, you know. So so they're not they're not aiming to sell it for a price equal to marginal cost at all. Um, and so um, I think that this, you know, going way back to Carl Menger, Menger's goal was to develop a theory that explained actual prices, right? not hypothetical prices in a hypothetical world. And, and in essence, that is what the, the Austrian tradition uh, through uh, Bambavrk, Mises, and Rothbard uh, is doing. Right? They're, try they're, they're, they're not interested in um, uh, you know, trying, to, trying to conform reality to an artificial general equilibrium construct. They're trying to explain what actually determines real prices that people actually pay and businesses actually receive. But I thought Austrians were the pie in the sky theorists. <laughs> I know. I know that is. There are certain uh, myths that man, it's just like banging your head against the wall. But I know. I know. It's it's uh, it's it is interesting though. Like I mean, when when whenever whenever the uh, sort of the the, the recession uh, hits the fan. Uh, you can read, for instance, investment literature, and and who do they turn to? Who do, who are the theorists they turn to more often than not? It's Austrians because the Austrians actually help people who actually have money on the line to make wiser decisions. What's interesting talking about cost is there are currently across America and beyond vast parking lots full of rental cars, 
sitting idly. There are, especially in desert settings, vast fields full of aircraft, which are parked, unused. And if this COVID slash travel debacle continues, uh, many of those might uh, ultimately be sold, uh, wholesaled, or, or however, and cost isn't going to have much to do with it. Yes, that's right. Yes, uh, exactly right. Um, and and you know they're 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 gonna they're gonna let it let those things go for whatever price I can get for it, regardless of of uh, the cost of production. And I mean, just think of, uh, all all of that represents a significant amount of capital consumption. Right? I mean, resources were sacrificed so that those things could be produced because entrepreneurs anticipated those would be productive assets, providing productive services, generating a stream of income. And, and now that by, by, by having those things just sort of sitting there, it, it's, it's, it's essentially consuming capital. And, and you know, over time, these machines, the machines uh, can uh, – they – you let a machine sit for any length of time, it, it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't run well. And it's, um, you know, who knows how much additional saving and investment it will take to get these machines up to running, if, even if now we get back to a so-called normal. Well, and, and not just from a cost perspective, but also in the ladder where you, were, that we were discussing earlier, the vertical ladder and the time element of all that, of course, introduces uncertainty. Right. And so that uncertainty is exactly the source, potentially, of profit. For people who are, uh, you know, smart and entrepreneurial and willing to take risks, and I noticed an article recently. This is before COVID. Maybe I read it in the last year or so about those damnable uh, hand blower things in the in the bathroom. Yeah, like give me a paper towel, please. Yes. And so the article was positing this is before COVID, mind you, that you know they don't really work. They actually spray the nasties yeah, in yeah, the public yeah. bathroom yeah. around, yeah. yeah as opposed to being more hygienic. And there's the old school ones with that sort of metal thing coming out, but there's some fancier ones now by Dyson, the vacuum people. Yeah. And uh, I thought to myself, you know, if this article were to spread, and, and whether true or not, if the public's perception were to be affected with respect to those hand blower things, I mean, imagine how many people and time and money and industry and R&D and just, you know, pure human energy had gone into developing them could be in a matter of months, an industry could effectively be sort of snuffed. Yeah. And that, and to me, that, that uh, element of risk is exactly why I don't begrudge people with a lot more money and a lot more brain power than me making, uh, making themselves quite rich, whoever came up with those hand dryers. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, if, if it, to the extent that we have an unhampered market, to the, so to the extent that we don't have people – uh, making money because the uh, the government gives them special privilege. The only way you can generate income is uh, by providing a, a good or productive service to those that demand it, who are going to pay money. And so, the more the more productive you are, uh, the more uh, services you provide to your fellow man, the larger your profits are going to be. Um, and and the the real big profits go to the people that are providing a particular uh, – who, who are partic a, a, a product or service that is particularly in high demand at a time when they're the only one or the, one of the early ones that have seen it and nobody else has seen it or nobody else figured it out or gave it a try or what have you. And so that's another thing, by the way, you see uh, it's rooted in, in, in the production structure as developed by uh, Rothbard and, and the Austrians is that – you know the, the 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 money income, the money. Well, while we talked about production effort being, uh, you know, moving down the structure production, but monetary income flows up the structure production. So, for instance, the uh, the manufacturer of the pickup receives income from the consumer, but then the uh, the, the 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 manufacturer of the pickup uh, spends money uh, up the structure production, obtaining the you know the the land and the labor and the factory and the the, the 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 tires and the windshields etc and then of course the the manufacturer of the windshield uh, spends money sends money up the structure production to the glass manufacturer what have you and so monetary income goes up the structure production and at every stage at every stage income is uh, earned by providing a good that is in demand and so uh, that's, I think, one of the great social benefits. This, the, this understanding of the production structure helps us see 
that one of the great benefits of a free market is that even the most greedy capitalist pig can only satisfy his desire to earn the biggest profits he can by serving other people. Right? And that's only in the free market. If you don't have a free market, there are many other ways that people who are greedy can satisfy their desires. Uh, they just do it by taking other people's stuff. But in a un free, unhampered market, the only way to reap a large profit is by satisfying the preferences of other people. So entrepreneurial profit is, of course, uncertain. Yes. Entrepreneurial loss and risk is very, very possible. And there's a difference between profit and interest. Mm -hmm. To help us understand this, Rothbard goes back at the beginning of this chapter to Mises' this concept of the evenly rotating economy. Yeah. H help us understand, uh, I guess, first of all, the written hour definition of the ERE and, and the written hour explanation of why this, this construct helps us better understand. Yeah. So uh, in order to understand the dynamic changing world in which we live, it's helpful to consider uh, the mental construct of what the economic order would be like if we didn't have change. And so Rothbard says, well, okay, and, and he, this, is, this is actually, again, developed by uh, Mises and, and others. It's, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's, it's an Austrian form of general equilibrium. But the idea is that let's suppose that at any given time, you know, there's different rates of return that can be earned in different investments. And <clears throat> excuse me, uh, if that's the case, then uh, well, where's the money going to go? Well, entrepreneurs will channel money into the high rate of return industries and take it out of the low rate of return industries. Now, if there are no further changes in um, consumer preferences, in the uh, quantity of natural resources available, in uh, time preferences, in population, right? the changes that will be taking place will be just adjustments uh, to you know, out of the low rate of return industries into the high rate of return industries. Now, as that happens, that sets in motion a process by which the rate of return in the high rate of return industry starts to fall, and the rate from the low rate of industries, uh, low rate of return industry starts to rise until we get to a point of equilibrium where they are essentially equal. Right? And if we get there, right, the next day, the exact same. Th thing, the exact same patterns of production and consumption would take place because there is no, remember, there's no change in, consu in consumer preferences, no change in resources availability, no change in technology, uh, no change in population. And so we would be in this, it's a, again, artificial world, but we, we, we'd be in this world where, where everything happens exactly the same. And that's why it's called the evenly rotating economy. The, the, the economy every day the economy that there would be there would be things happening, but it would revolve around the same equilibrium point, right? And so uh, that's what he means by the evenly rotating economy. Now that is that's a, that's a construct that is helpful because we know in that construct in the evenly rotating economy, um, we know that well we know what the future is going to hold because it's going to be exactly the same as was, you know, tomorrow's going to be in terms of eco the economy, tomorrow's going to be exactly the same as the day before, the day after tomorrow is going to be exactly the same as tomorrow. And so nothing changes. So people, producers will know what their demand is. Um, they'll know what the prices or factors are going to be. Um, and they know it's not going to change. And so there will not be any uncertainty. And therefore, there will not be any opportunity for entrepreneurs to error. And there will also be no opportunity for certain entrepreneurs to uh, to to sort of be more uh, insightful or to be just better at satisfying other people's preferences. And in other words, there will be no profit and loss. Profit and loss would will not would not uh, be there. Well, so then you ask, well, okay, well, well th th there would still be mon money incomes. Yes, there still be incomes. Well, who's going to reap those incomes? Well, uh, it will be. Landowners and laborers. They, the, the, the landowners will get the land rent. The uh, laborers will get uh, their uh, economic rent called wages. Um, and there's still time preference, right? The preferences that are that are that are that are fixed are still 
uh, uh, ma uh, manifest positive time preference. And so people would still prefer present money to future money, and so there would still be interest income. Right? So interest income is the income reaped uh, f by uh, saver capitalists of, of supplying present money in exchange for future money. And of course, it's cl easiest in some sense to see in the loanable funds market when you know people borrow and lend, but the same basic uh, action, action of supplying present money in exchange for future money also takes place in the production structure, which is another important point that Rothbard brings out, that the act of production is also the act of supplying money in the present to owners of the factors of production to get, own, or to get control of those factors to produce a product that they are going to sell for money in the future. And so every act of production is also an act of supplying present money in exchange for future money. And so interest income is something that is 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 uh, is something that's desired and required by every producer. And 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 also then it it becomes a cost to the producer. In other words, if 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 I you know if if if, if some company in, in invests invests a million dollars in something uh, to produce a certain product to produce produce T-shirts. Well, that million dollars could have invest, been invested someplace else, maybe just stuck in bonds or something, earned five percent. And so that five percent of interest that he foregoes to engage in t-shirt production, that five percent is a cost. And so, if 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 the if the return in an economy, uh, in a dynamic economy, is is less than five percent, if he borrows at five percent, or if he invests his own money, and so he has to incur sort of the opportunity cost of of, of foregoing that five percent. If his rate of return is only 3%, well, he gets a positive rate of return, but he would have done better investing and getting 5% elsewhere, so he actually earned an economic loss. Um, that happens in the dynamic economy. In, in the evenly rotating economy, of course, there is no profit and loss, and so the, the in, in essence, the, the, the sale price of every product is equal to the sum of the prices of the factors of production and interest. And so by by sort of painting that world that 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 again here here we go again that the the I said the superior uh, the the realistic superior the Austrians the Austrians know okay we don't live in that world right and there's nothing special or more uh, meaningful or ethically better about that world right and so you know that that evenly rotating economy and the relationships that we think would attain in the evenly rotating economy that's not something we're trying to achieve. It's just – it's a mental construct that we use to say, OK, this is the way things would be in this world without change. And so what is life like when there is change? Well, when there is change, oh, there's this other economic uh, category of income, this other category of income dealing with how well the entrepreneur uh, forecasts future demand based on this uncertain future. And that other economic ca uh, category is profit. And so when the, when the entrepreneur is successful, more successful than others as satisfying – his customers, he will reap a profit. And if he is not, if, he, if he's really bad, uh, and not just in general, but just, you know, the beauty of the market is you could be bad one time and you could learn from that and be better the next time, right? And and if you are really good, uh, you can't just rest on your laurels, right? Because the minute you start to not be the best at satisfying customers, you're going to start either reaping lower profits or earning losses. It's funny that you bring up the idea that the ERE is not something we should be striving to accomplish because my recollection from my undergrad econ classes was that there is always this sort of vague sense that equilibrium, equilibrium really was the goal and that supply and demand should meet at some happy price. And the fact that they don't is sort of unfortunate or at least inefficient and that it somehow implicates – uh, that state planners could do a better job. I mean, that's that's my vague recollection. Oh, a absolutely. I mean, the 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 uh, benchmark, if you will, for a lot of economic policy, uh, especially sort of well regula regulation policy and antitrust regulation, the 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 benchmark criteria is this this false, unrealistic. Um, uh, sort of uh, e equilibrium that would obtain in perfect competition, right? And so you've got two problems there. One, you've got the world of perfect competition that doesn't exist. And then we're going to use as a criteria the equilibrium that would obtain in that world of perfect competition that also doesn't and never will exist. I think what well, may have been Harold Demsetz actually that referred to this sort of as the nirvana fallacy. We use the criteria – of a, of, 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 a, of a state that doesn't exist 
as our criteria for reality. And oh, surprise, surprise, reality is not like that. And so that is used as justification for all sorts of intervention to somehow try to get us closer to what doesn't exist. Um, now, that's the that's the most well-known nirvana fallacy. There's a second nirvana fallacy, which is that nirvana was a good musical group. But that's a different – that's a time for another lecture. But Well, ladies and gentlemen, that is sort of the background on Chapter 5. I want to encourage you to pick up this book and read it. You know, if you have any uh, – if you yourself or you have any young people in your life, children, grandchildren – who are thinking about undergraduate, uh, you might want to take a look at Grove City College. It has a, you know, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Herbner is there, Dr. Sean Rittenauer is there, and also a great young GMU professor who is Austrian-friendly, Caleb. Caleb Fuller. Caleb Fuller, and I apologize for not recalling his last name, uh, but someone I was able to meet when I visited, a great guy. And so you really have a, a cadre, uh, you know, of uh, economists there that would give you an excellent, I think, uh, uh, environment to learn from. So you can find the book at Mises.org slash store. There's a little shopping cart at the top of Mises.org. You can go in and just look up Man, Economy, and State. We have a beautiful hardcover scholars edition, which I believe with the code H-A-P-O-D for Human Action Podcast comes down to only $20. And we have a really tiny print uh, soft cover edition, which I think comes down to $10 or maybe even $5. Forgive me for not recalling, but uh, you know, it's a book that you, it's one of those books. It's certainly one of those four or five. Like I have way too many books at home, but it's one of those four or five that I think you want to own physically. Uh, it, it just is. It, it's the kind of book you want to scratch in, you want to make notes, you want to go back, you want to dog ear the pages. But if you're a Kindle or EPUB kind of person, then just go to to Mises.org, type in Man Economy State, and you're going to pull up a beautiful HTML file edited by our great editor, Judy Thomason, and you can just skip ahead to wherever you want to be, uh, and, and it's really a fantastic book. So we hope you'll read this book and, and go along with us because, as was mentioned earlier during this week at Mises U, somebody has to do the hard work and actually know what the hell they're talking about. Um, we, we can't all just live in a world of social media and platitudes and 140 characters. There's, there's, uh, it's, it's very important if we are going to offer an alternative vision of society, one that I think would be far more just and humane and fair, uh, that we also have the uh, ideological or, uh, or technical background to, to at least help defend that. And so that's the, the idea of the podcast here is for me to act as a conduit between you and some of the great economists in our circle. So uh, we'll be back next week. We will tear into... Uh, how interest rates arise as one of the factors of production, and, and we'll be moving through the book. And it's going to make it a lot easier and more enjoyable for you to read along with us. So to all that said, thank you for being a listener of the Human Action Podcast, and have a great weekend. Thanks, Sean. Thank you. The Human Action Podcast is available on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, and on Mises.org. Subscribe to get new episodes every week and find more content like this on Mises.org.